In an unusual move, the Pentagon have officially released three videos of unidentified aerial phenomena, which have taken the internet by storm. Speculation is rife about the nature of these objects, whether they could be alien UFOs, and why the Pentagon have released them now. Here at Cool Worlds, we do not study UFOs or atmospheric anomalies, but I know that many of you have been curious about these videos since they were first leaked two years ago. To answer your questions, today I called in with Mick West, who has been devoting himself to figuring out what is really going on with these videos. So stay tuned for some answers as to what these videos could really be showing. Okay, so hi Mick, thanks so much for joining me on Cool Worlds today. Um, as soon as these videos from the Pentagon dropped, the internet has been exploding, wondering whether this could be confirmation of aliens. I think aliens exist is now one of the top trending things on Twitter right now. Everyone's super excited and interested in what's going on. Um, but, you know, I think it's very important that we have voices from the other side offering some more sober thoughts about what we're seeing. And you have sort of, a, I've seen your work on YouTube, it's fantastic, and seen you on like the Joe Rogan podcast, and you're one of the premier voices that are really working to try and understand these sorts of videos and debunk other work as well. So my first question I wanted to ask you is how did you get into this? It's kind of an, an unusual field, debunking. How did you get interested in debunking? Well, I've always been interested in debunking things since I was very young. Uh, my brother used to be interested in kind of paranormal stuff, uh, and I was very interested in UFOs and things like that. And I eventually got more interested in science and then got more and more interested in figuring out the explanations for things rather than just being entertained by the things themselves. So I'll figure out like, you know, why a particular thing happened. Uh, and then fast forward, I uh, went into the video game industry, I made some money doing the Tony Hawk video game series and retired uh, relatively young, got to do what I, I enjoyed doing. And one of the things I wanted to do, I always wanted to do was learn to fly. So I started taking mm -hmm. flying lessons. And in the course of that, I came across this chemtrails conspiracy theory. And I thought that would be a fun little thing to debunk on the internet. So I set up a little blog trying to debunk this one theory thinking that I'd just have to post a few explanations and then uh, they would all be sorted. Uh, but, you know, it's 12 years later and uh, we're still we're still at, uh, the chemtrails are still a real conspiracy theory. But that led to other things. I was debunking other conspiracy theories. Uh, but that eventually led to me being uh, asked to look at uh, UFO videos. And because I was quite good at analyzing uh, videos of planes flying high, uh, I got quite good at analyzing videos of mysterious objects flying uh, high up in the sky or wherever they happen to be. And so I've been kind of taking on more and more uh, UFO debunking in past years. And it's kind of a fun topic to look into. Right. So when these videos first came out, obviously, you know, a lot of people have this immediate reaction that uh, this must be aliens. Um, you've had time to process it now and, and to look at them. But when you, when you first saw them, um, I'm curious what, what your reaction was. Well, when I first saw them, they immediately reminded me of an earlier case, which is the Chilean Navy UFO case, which was, I think, about a year or two before that. And this was a case where the Chilean Navy had been investigating this uh, UFO. I mean, it was a UFO. They hadn't identified it. Uh, and they couldn't figure out what it was. And they eventually released with great fanfare this, this video and said, well, this is a genuine UFO that we've had a team of scientists unable to verify. And it was like a little black blob in the distance type thing, similar to some of the videos we've seen. And I and a bunch of other people almost immediately identified it as being a plane uh, that mm. just looks like that because it was far away and it was in infrared. And the pilots in the, the helicopter who were filming it didn't realize where it was. They had the same misconception about it being closer when it was further away. So with these new videos, my immediate reaction was that, oh, this looks like that other case, so maybe it is similar. And so I started comparing them to that. And you know, right. one of them, the, the, the Fleur video from the Nimitz was kind of similar. The other two were a bit different, but you know, the same type of thing. They were uh, infrared images of things that were far away. And uh, in at least two of the videos, Fleur and Gimbal, it's consistent with it being a plane and the other one, not so much. But uh, yeah, my, that was my initial impression. 
Well, it sounds like you were a skeptic right from the start, which maybe doesn't doesn't surprise me too much. Now, there's three of them. You mentioned these names before. There's Fleur, uh, Gimbal, and Gofast. Is that are those the official names? Yeah, the official names. Yeah, from the Navy. With, with all of the context of both the videos and your own uh, comparisons to the Chilean incident, for instance, and the audio, um, could we maybe go through these these videos, maybe one by one, and tell me what is your interpretation about what it is that we're seeing here? All right, well, let's start with the Fleur video. That's the oldest video. Uh, Fleur video is it's actually a very small video. It's like 200 pixels wide or something like that. Very, very small and blurry. And it shows like a dark dot in the distance, dark kind of shape. And uh, the camera operator who was in this jet following this, this thing is cycling through different cameras trying to get a better look at it. But you never really get any good look at it. Mm -hmm. The object itself, if you pay attention to what's going on, the object itself never actually moves from the center of the screen. It does appear to move, but that's only because the camera is changing. It changes lenses between like a, a near, uh, like a, a narrow field of view and a wider field of view or it's changing between the infrared mode and the, the TV mode, the visible light mode. So whenever it has to change from one camera to another, it, ca the camera, it loses the lock on the object and has to reacquire it. So what we're okay. seeing basically is a, an essentially static object. It is actually moving, it's because you can see that the, the camera is tracking from, from right to left, uh, uh, because you can see the numbers, uh, the, the heading at the top of the screen changes. Mm -hmm. So it is moving. So it's entirely, co it's entirely consistent with it being a plane that's very far away, probably somewhere in the range of 50 to 100 miles away. And the jet that's following it, again, perhaps doesn't realize just how far away it is and thinks that it's a little bit closer and hence moving a little bit differently or perhaps is a bit uh, uh, smaller than it actually is. It could be a quite large plane 100 miles away. Right. So why? So if I can ask, why didn't they catch that on the radar then? Why? Why weren't they able to identify that as an aircraft already? They. It, it was wasn't where they thought it was. It's the same thing with the Chilean case. Uh, radar is great if you know where to look, but if you're looking in like sector A and it's in sector Q, then you're not going to see it in sector A. So if they were just looking in, in a range of say like forty miles in front of them, they're not going to see it on the radar. He got a ping on his radar, I think, and you see the little uh, range crop up, but it shows 99.99, which means it wasn't able to get an actual range distance, mm -hmm. which uh, could mean that it was blocking it somehow, but it could also just mean that it was just too far away to get, a, get an accurate reading. I think that's probably what, what happened. Uh, okay. He thought there was something close to him. He asked the ship perhaps if there was something next to them and they looked directly in front of him and didn't see it, but he was really over here. So that's why they didn't yeah. see it. And that, that one definitely looks the least strange of the three, I would say, as, uh, you know, looking at it from the outside. So moving on to gimbal, which we seem to see something which looks like it's rotating. There's two blobs. Uh, you've talked about this in a few of your videos over on your channel, which I will make sure to link down below. Um, but tell us, what do you think is going on with the gimbal video? What I think is going on with the gimbal video is that it's actually the glare from the infrared, in the infrared. So the engines of a plane are very, very hot and they show up in the heat sensitive camera essentially as bright lights. Now in this video, uh, it's inverted, so hot is black. So it, it looks like uh, a black object and you've got the shape of the glare. Now you're familiar with in astronomy, you often, you often see what looks like a, a cross mm -hmm. uh, over a, a star or a celestial object of some sort because of uh, the diffraction effect. And this, this is actual, you know, this, these, these the aperture of the camera has an effect on the, what the glare looks like. And what's happening, I think, here is that you're getting essentially a flying saucer shaped glare, which I've actually replicated with little cameras I have on my own. And mm -hmm. it's because it's so bright, because the engine is so hot, it's obscuring the actual outline of the plane, which you might see uh, in the infrared, which it wouldn't be very hot anyway, so you wouldn't, wouldn't see very much of it. So you just, all you're seeing is this glare of the engine. Now, where it gets confusing is where it seems to rotate yeah and this this is this is quite a difficult thing to explain to people but uh, essentially it's kind of a limitation of the camera system that they have they, they mount it in such a way that it can only rotate along its forward axis and it can only do a kind of an up and down rotation around one horizontal axis and to able to, to be able to track something you actually need three axes of rotation mm -hmm. so uh, for it to go left to right, when it's actually tilted down a bit, it actually ends up having to rotate the camera. And that rotation is internally corrected for. 
but because they're, mm. they're doing an internal correction of the rotation, this means that the seam doesn't rotate, but anything that's an optical uh, artifact within the camera does rotate. So yeah. the shape of the glare itself rotates. And this is something I've actually, I've replicated this, this exact thing with camera setups of my own using like a small camera mounted on an arm and rotating it and then use applying derotation. And you see this exact same thing, a kind of a saucer shaped glare that rotates independently of the horizon, which happens to be my garage in the, in the video I made. But yeah, this, this is something you can demonstrate that it happens. It makes perfect sense if you look at the actual mechanics of, of the gimbal system. Uh, the, the gimbal, if you look at the, the patterns they describe, that it will, they, they have a, a gimbal lock correction that happens between plus or minus three degrees around zero. And that's the exact point that this rotation happens around three degrees. Oh. And there's, a, there's kind of an aurora almost, like a white uh, glow almost around that as well. What, what do you think that, that's caused by? Yeah, they describe it as an, uh, a, a glowing aura. Um, like I think, like they think of it as yeah. some kind of, they, they think it's some kind of force field or something. <laughs> but that's actually a very common thing that you see in infrared uh, heat heat sensitive camera footage. It's the sharpening artifact. So it's an unsharp mass, which you probably use in, in astrophotography. Sometimes it it sharpens the uh, the boundaries between dark and light regions. So it makes the edges of things be more defined and helps you see things. And I did a little video and I showed lots of examples of this happening. Uh, there's even one of a little girl dancing and she gets this exact same aura around her because it's okay. been filled in, filled in this heat sensitive camera with this, this filter turned on. They're using a thing called an unsharp mask, which is just a very common type of sharpening filter. It's very easy to implement. And now the, the last one is GoFast, which has um, really ex extraordinary commentary by the, by the pilots who are really seem to be amazed by what they're seeing. Oh my gosh, dude. Wow, look at that, man. Look at the fly. And that thing does look like it's like a bat through hell, but it's just a kind of a, a tiny speck. What, what is it that we're looking at there? Yeah, it looks like it's moving really fast and it looks like it's very close to the, uh, the water. And this is what people mm. have presented as being. But if you, if you do the math, which isn't very complicated, uh, you can actually use the numbers that are on screen because it has, it has a range number. You have the altitude of the plane itself, which I think is 22,000 feet. So, and you have an angle uh, down that the camera is looking down. So if you know how high the plane is, you know how far away the object is, and you know the angle down, then you can just use the uh, the sign of the angle. Just trigonometry, um, yeah. Yeah, it's just simple. You can simply work out w how far away it actually is and how far below the plane it is. And it ends up being halfway between the plane and the water. So it's actually at about, uh, I think, eleven or 12,000 feet. Hmm. And uh, once you know that, you can also figure out how fast it's going. You can do a kind of 3D recreation of it, which I did. And it doesn't actually have to be moving very fast. It can be as slow as, I think, 40 knots. And the fastest it would be going is actually more like 100 knots. Uh, and that range of speeds is, is quite a, a reasonable relative speed differential between the wind at 11,000 feet and the wind at 22,000 feet. Because the wind mm. at 22,000 feet could be moving very, very fast, whereas the wind at 11 could be moving slow and or in a different direction. So what it looks like to me is something that's moving at wind speed. And the most likely thing is a balloon. And, mm. and at, from that, an even more likely thing is that it's a loose weather balloon. It could possibly be a very large bird. Uh, people you know, make fun of me for suggesting this, but there is a possibility that it could be something like a, like a pelican, like a, a large enough bird if it's well insulated. I think it's an unlikely thing just because it, uh, it got pinged on the radar and uh, it looks cold, but it's possible. But I think the most likely thing that it's just a balloon uh, that is in between the plane and the ocean. And because it's at this halfway point between the plane and the ocean and hardly moving, the apparent speed of the balloon over the ocean is the same as the speed of the jet itself, which is moving, I think, something like at 350 miles an hour. So it looks like it's an object that's zipping along the surface of the ocean at 350 miles an hour, where in fact it's just a balloon drifting at 1,100 feet over the, over the ocean. And the, the radar pinged this, so does that give you any kind of size constraint on it, the fact that the, radio, the radar saw it? And it, the radar itself doesn't, well, not really, because if, if it, radar targets can be very small, you can have uh, targets that are just like little retroreflectors, which are very, very small. Uh, 
if you know what type of thing it was, it would give you uh, some, some idea of how big it was, the strength of the return, but that's not something that's actually shown up uh, yeah. on, the, on the radar. Uh, you can tell though from the field of view of the camera and the distance to the object, how big it is. And I think I worked it out as being somewhere in the range of I think six to 12 feet uh, across. So not particularly big and something that is kind of consistent with a uh, weather balloon type thing. Yeah. Um, now, of course, uh, along with these videos, there is the the commentary, of course, on on that last one especially um, that this kind of uh, really stands out. But we've also heard from some pilots actually offer, you know, they've been on appearing on podcasts and things, offering their opinions. In particular, um, David Fraver has been uh, talking about how he thinks that this is really an object of non-terrestrial origin with respect to the USS Nimitz incident. Um, now. You, it's kind of difficult, I guess, to take this expertise in 3D geometry, mechanics, uh, and apply that to human sociology, because this is this is very different. This is someone's personal testimony. But how do you weigh that testimony in the, in the body of evidence of, I mean, what, what do you think he saw? Do you, do you think that it was a hallucination, or do you think he was just mistaken? What I, I think, uh, well, first of all, you've got to remember that these are two different incidents in, in, within the, the Nimitz encounter. David Fraber mm -hmm. went out and there was another pilot in another plane and two other officers there. And they, they saw something and they, they, they thought they flew around and they thought it flew off into the distance. Uh, and then they went back to the ship and then later another plane flew out in not the exact same area and wasn't particularly like, looking for that particular thing. Uh, and that plane got a ping and they, you know, they were like, keep your eyes open. And uh, he, he took this video. Mm -hmm. uh, Fravor's account of, of the object is something that's zigzagging all over the place. There's also like radar accounts, like the radar people said that they saw it flying from 80,000 to sea level in a fraction of a second, which is pretty much impossible. But all, none, of these, none of these accounts actually match. They're all kind of different things. So it's, from my perspective, it seems like there's, there's the radar stuff, which is radar glitches. There's the video, which is video of a distant plane. And then there's David Fravers' account, which I don't really know what it is. I think the best theory I've kind of come up with is that when he thought he was flying around in a circle and this thing was mirroring him on the other side of the circle, so there's two things flying around a circle, mm -hmm. it was actually kind of similar to what we, we see in the, uh, in the GoFast thing, a kind of a parallax thing. There may have been something in the middle, like maybe a balloon or some kind of drone or something like that, it was uh, in the middle of this circle and he thought it was on the far side of the circle. So there's this thing like a balloon or something is flying around it. He thinks it's flying around following him, but really what he's seeing is something that's not moving. And it's just, you know, this, this illusion. Mm -hmm. And then he decides, he decides to cut across the middle of this circle to the other side. And then he says, he sees this thing coming towards him and it zips by him and flies off into the distance. Now, if, if he's in the mindset, that this was something on the other side of a circle when it's actually in the middle of the circle. Then when he decides to go across the circle, it's going to look like it, it is flying towards him from the other side of the circle. And because it gets towards him much quicker than he anticipates, because it's only halfway across the circle, it's going to look like it zips by him. It'll look like it's accelerating off into the distance. So I think if there was something that he saw, and you have no reason to doubt him, then it probably was some kind of loss of situational awareness type thing like that. Yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense. Um, the well, obviously these videos and the reports that David has been giving us have been coming out over the last couple of years, um, but and a lot of people have been drawn to the timing of this recent uh, Pentagon release. Um, obviously, we're all in lockdown right now, um, and people have been maybe wondering why is it that if the videos are already out, um, what what is it with the timing here? What what do you think is going on with why it is the Pentagon have decided to say this is this is real i think the reason is the most banal and uninteresting reason you can think of the reason is that they've been getting lots of freedom of information act requests for these videos that takes up a lot of time and manpower and work to deal with these respond to them like either deny them or, or accept them so they've got a bunch of them they had the videos they see that the videos are exactly the same as what's already in the public domain they're just a bit higher quality uh, with on a higher resolution, they're just less compressed. You can't really see anything different in them. They thought like, well, let's just release them. There's no reason not to. And then we won't have to deal with all of this, uh, this paperwork anymore. Uh, just people bureaucracy. Stop asking yeah. us. 
Yeah, because people are asking them, are there more videos? You know, what are the videos that you have? Are they different to this video? So the, they just they thought they would clear this up by releasing the actual copies of the video, which were exactly the same as the old videos, really. <laughs> they thought they would clear it up. Obviously, the media took it in a different way. They thought that it's like, um, you know, Navy releases genuine UFO videos, aliens are real. But from the Navy's perspective, <laughs> nothing really changed. And they, they're not, they had no motivation other than not wanting to do a bunch of work. I guess uh, one thing that always strikes me is very peculiar about the whole premise of these, of these videos and these reports that we hear is that, you know, an advanced civilization spends an inordinate amount of energy to fly light years across to, to get to our atmosphere. And really all they do is sort of fly around erratically, but apparently quite blatantly. They're not, you know, going out of their way to masquerade, you know, to hide themselves. You kind of obvious, you can see them in these videos if they were real. Um, and so it's kind of like, what's the motivation behind, behind this? That's as an astronomer, I always get hung up. It's like, does, it just doesn't make any sense that this would be something they would do. So I'm kind of curious as to your take about this whole premise of alien visitation is do you believe in aliens and do you think this is something that is plausibly something they would they would undergo and do well i, I believe in aliens in the sense that i think in you know the vastness of the universe and the the time length of the universe that uh, life forms have arisen and probably intelligent life has arisen too mm -hmm. i don't believe there's any good evidence that we've actually det detected that anywhere uh, the idea that they would fly over here and do stuff um, it does seem a bit ridiculous, but um, I guess you could construct some kind of reality in which that makes sense. Like, for example, if uh, Earth was some kind of uh, garden that was planted by alien lives and they're just observing us secretly, and they've perhaps got some kind of special cloaking uh, devices that they use, and they have a base on the far side of the moon, and then they've been here for thousands of years, and they just pop over from the moon to, to check us now and then. So you can yeah. construct a, a reality, like a narrative, in which it makes sense. But the bottom line is you've got to look at what's the actual evidence of it happening. And, uh, and there isn't really any, any good evidence. Yeah, I like, I like the quote from Carl Sagan, who was a famous astronomer, he used to say that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And certainly the, the claim of you know, another, another civilization coming here and visiting and flying around is an extraordinary claim. And I guess that's where, you know, a lot of us have a big problem is that the, the sort of evidence we're seeing does not pass that bar of even mildly significant evidence, let alone extraordinary evidence. So there's, there's kind of a, a mismatch, but people are drawn towards this. And, um, you know, I'm kind of curious, why do you think that is? Why is there so much interest in, in, the, in these videos? Yeah, there's, there's a couple of things there. I mean, first of all, there are a lot of people who think that they personally have that extraordinary evidence. They think mm -hmm. that they have experienced some kind of UFO uh, encounter that is sufficiently anomalous that it counts as some kind of alien thing, or they think they've actually uh, seen an alien or talked to an alien or been touched by an alien. So there's a whole bunch of people in the UFO community, the experiencers who uh, know that it is true in, in their own frame of reference and so they go with that then the other thing is that ufos and aliens are just a real fun thing it's kind right. of like you know what if superman was real you know what if aliens are real like it's this these kind of fun science fiction uh things from from both our childhoods and from just what people imagine as scientists what would what would aliens be like what would an alien life form actually be like and what would happen if it came to visit what effect would it have on civilization and just how fascinating that would be it would be just the most amazing thing ever if we could discover alien life so people really want it to be true and i think a lot of the culture uh, that we have both reflects that and magnifies that you have things like the x-files when the x-files came out you have a boost in sightings of ufos just because it enters the popular culture, magnifies something that's already there, and people start getting excited and then going out and looking for things. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time, Mick. I really appreciate you giving us some insights into these videos. I know lots of my viewers would appreciate it. And uh, I'll make sure we'll link down below to your channel where you can find much more detailed videos that really go through all the steps on these, uh, these new UFO videos. So um, make sure you check that out if you want to get more. So thanks again, Nick. Thank you. Very interesting stuff.